solitary confinement is driving me crazy. I, I don't understand how someone can subject another human being to this type of punishment and think that it's justified. It is totally inhumane. There's no way around it. You know, you really don't truly understand the impact of removing someone from human contact for years. It could even be for weeks, but it has a it has a, a negative effect on that person. So the human contact, as I said, we're built for that, and it's so important. And it's like it's like totally removing someone from society and putting them in a dark hole, right? And everybody's walking over it, and he's shouting from the bottom of that hole, but nobody hears him. You know, and it's dark down there. It just drives you crazy. And I experienced that so many times where you, I'm shouting, I'm there, I want, I want somebody to just, you know, come talk to me. You know, just shake my hand. Something, you know, because you, you urge for that. And I couldn't get it. You know, so you have to start playing uh, uh, tricks with your own mind. You know, just to try to survive this here thing. I, I feel though that I went through this to be here to share it with you all and let you all know that what we're doing to prisoners and to guys in solitary confinement is totally inhumane. We're driving people crazy. And this is our criminal justice system that's supposed to serve and protect us. But we are literally driving men insane. And those that are already insane, we're just putting them in the casket. That's all we're doing. There's no rehabilitation. There's no such thing as justice in an unjust environment. You can't get there. Yeah, so as you can see, we wanted to lead with a video from the ACLU out of uh, deference to our visitor today. And uh, also, that is a extremely tough act to follow, but we'll endeavor to uh, do our best. So thanks again. Uh, so as that video mentioned, uh, first of all, that man's name was Anthony Graves. And uh, as the video mentioned, he spent 12 years in solitary confinement. Uh, his full story can be found on the ACLU and Innocence Project websites. But uh, essentially, he was wrongfully convicted for the murder of six people in the early 90s. And uh, there are many alleged instances of prosecutorial uh, misconduct in his case. But uh, perhaps the most egregious one uh, was that he was convicted primarily on the testimony of one witness and the prosecution did not disclose to the defense uh, that that witness had actually recanted his testimony uh, before the trial began. Um, when that came to light years later, uh, they actually, uh, a special prosecutor uh, sta stated on behalf of the state of Texas that he was most likely innocent and uh, the state dropped all charges against him. So uh, in the interim during his in incarceration, Graves spent almost 22 hours a day without any human contact. Uh, he received his meals through a small slot in his cell door. Uh, he had a little time to exercise each day, but other than that, that was uh, essentially all the human contact that he had in a given day. Uh, in his own words, the worst aspect of his incarceration was that for years at a time, he was deprived of any uh, meaningful contact with his family. And uh, one more thing that we wanted to point out is that uh, Mr. Graves spent uh, the bulk of his time in confinement in an uh, eight by 12 space, and that, that's something we've depicted for you here on the floor in front of the room, or sorry, in front of the podium. And uh, that's just to give you an idea of how large eight by 12 feet is. Um, and that's the space that Anthony Graves and many prisoners like him spend the duration of their solitary confinement in. Uh, slide, please. So uh, Anthony Graves is uh, not a, a typical prisoner in that he was later freed amid substantial allegations of prosecut uh, prosecutorial misconduct. Uh, but the duration of his confinement and the conditions that he faced in solitary are actually very commonplace in this country. And uh, this presentation is going to talk uh, about how that came to be, and we're going to start by going with the history of uh, solitary confinement in America. So what you're looking at now is uh, Eastern State Penitentiary, and that was a facility that was constructed in 1829 uh, on the outskirts of Philadelphia. And the people who built it uh, were religious figures in that community, primarily Quakers, uh, and those people were highly dissatisfied with the, the existing state of incarceration in America. Uh, they saw you know, public beatings and uh, public corporal punishment of criminals that they thought was barbaric. Uh, they also saw uh, in existing prisons how many, many prisoners would be confined into one space in pens almost, and uh, prisoner on prisoner abuse was exceedingly common. So they thought that that only served to reinforce uh, people's criminality 
and they wanted to go with a more rehabilitative approach, and so they built Eastern State as a revolutionary type of facility. Uh, so at uh, Eastern State, prisoners were kept alone in their cells at all times. Uh, they were allowed no human interaction, and uh, the only interaction they were allowed, I should say, is with their warden and with a reverend. Uh, the only book they had was the Bible, and uh, the idea was that through these types of conditions, uh, the prisoners would eventually come to repent for their sins, having all the solitude to reflect on their past actions. Uh, they would come to God and eventually return to society as reformed Christians. Uh, however, there were indications that the positive effects uh, of solitary that the Quakers were hoping for did not come to pass, or uh, at least were highly outweighed by the exceedingly negative psychological consequences that solitary uh, inflicted on them. Uh, visitors to Eastern State saw the prisoners there were suffering from terrible psychological disorders, and uh, they concluded that solitary was far worse than traditional methods of incarceration. Slide. Uh, one of those visitors was uh, Charles Dickens, uh, the famous author from, from England, obviously. And uh, when he visited uh, Eastern State, he, later wrote, or he was horrified by what he saw, and when he returned back to England, he later wrote that those who design the system do not know what it is that they're doing, I hold this slow and daily tampering with the mysteries of the brain to be immeasurably worse than any torture of the body. And because its ghastly signs and tokens are not so palpable to the eye, and it exhorts few cries that human ears can hear, therefore the more I denounce it as a secret punishment in which slumbering humanity is not roused up to stay. Uh, so criticisms like this were representative of attitudes um, uh, in America about solitary confinement, and the best indication of that was the Medley Supreme Court case. And in uh, Medley, the court found a Colorado statute uh, that authorized the solitary confinement of prisoners on death row uh, unconstitutional. And it's notable that they didn't do, uh, the, sorry, the court didn't find the statute unconstitutional due to a violation of the Eighth Amendment, uh, but rather uh, that it violated the ex post facto clause of the Constitution. But uh, in spite of that distinction, the opinion still uh, explicitly and extensively discussed the terrible psychological damage that inflicted uh, or that, uh, that prolonged solitary confinement inflicted. Uh, so as evidenced by this particular case and uh, just other prevailing attitudes in society about solitary, um, the practice uh, eventually was discontinued at Eastern State in 1913. And that was essentially representative of the rest of the country's prisons for the next uh, 70 years or so. And there were some exceptions like Alcatraz, which we've all heard of, and uh, a less famous prison named Marion Federal, uh, Federal Penitentiary in Illinois that was the replacement to Alcatraz. Uh, but even at those institutions, solitary really wasn't imposed on any sort of widespread or systematic basis. Uh, it was typically used as a punishment for infractions and only imposed on a small number of people for limited periods of time. The uh, most, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and, and sorry, the, uh, what I should say is that that's nothing like the current system today uh, where you have these uh, supermax facilities that are increasingly prevalent in America. They're very common now and you have tens of th thousands of people that are subject to this type of confinement for the duration of their uh, extended prison sentences. So the, uh, the most immediate and visible cause of the current system of solitary confinement uh, happened at the Marion Federal Penitentiary in Illinois in 1983. And in October 22nd of that year, uh, two members of the Aryan Brotherhood uh, stabbed two corrections officers uh, viciously. And uh, previously to that time, only a small number of prisoners were kept in long-term solitary at Marion. But in response to those murders, uh, you had the head of the Bureau of Prisons testifying in front of Congress, the prison, uh, the prison administrator putting the entire, uh, the entire Marion penitentiary into what they called a permanent lockdown. So they're essentially imposing the same uh, solitary confinement conditions that previously were applied to only a limited uh, set of prisoners at Marion onto the entire uh, prison system. And uh, the Marion incident's aftermath rippled throughout uh, the American penal system in the years uh, that followed as states responded by converting uh, existing prisons or building new ones uh, into facilities that housed their populations in conditions that mimic those at Marion. Uh, so that effectively resulted in the long-term confinement in solitary conditions for a substantial number of prisoners in America. The uh, Marion incident did not happen in isolation. Uh, there are obviously many other factors uh, that this presentation will address, uh, things like mandatory minimum sentencing, uh, the drug war that the Nixon administration declared, uh, the increasing prevalence in American society of tough-on-crime attitudes. Uh, all those things and others that we'll, that we'll talk to you later uh, were other obviously very viable causes of the increasing prevalence of solitary confinement in America, but 
Uh, for now, suffice it to say that the Marion incident was the immediate causal factor that precipitated the development of uh, solitary in America, where we now have 44 institutions, or sorry, 44 states and the federal system uh, all maintaining supermax facilities that house prisoners uh, in long-term solitary conditions, and that that population now includes more than 20,000 people. Uh, so this presentation is going to uh, take a variety of perspectives that are now familiar to all of us in this class, ranging from external situationism to media perspectives uh, to law and economics, and we're going to examine a variety of issues that uh, will hopefully explain to you uh, how and why the situation came into being and uh, how and why it might be addressed. And uh, before we do that, though, we wanted to show you another quick video. I was held in isolation in the county jail maybe nine months. I don't, I don't know the exact figure. I was in isolation for six months. So I say five months and two weeks, most of my time in county. Tens of thousands of young people all across the United States every year are charged as if adults held in adult jails and prisons. Many of them are held in solitary confinement to protect them from adult prisoners or simply to punish them. If you're alone and just have nothing but your thoughts, start talking to yourself, start doing some embarrassing things like drawing on the walls with various body fluids and um, basically provoking others just to have an argument, uh, just dumb stuff, you know? The youngest person I interviewed was held in solitary confinement beginning at age 13. Being held in solitary confinement means being alone in your cell for 22 to 24 hours a day. I wanted to get out of there. I felt like I wanted to die. I felt like I wanted to hurt somebody. I just wanted, I just didn't know how to process the feeling of being by myself without no positive human contact. Kids in particular need a high level of interaction with adults, responsible adults, and with other kids. And we have to find a way to keep people safe without isolating them. It changes you, it hurts you, it makes you depressed, it makes you want to act out, it makes you angry. It's, it's no rehabilitation. Youth in solitary are also prevented from uh, regular programming, including education, um, including recreation. Um, in many instances, they come out only to shower and then only a few times a week. So um, the lack of social stimulation, um, the lack of uh, real meaningful any programming, be it mental health program or educational programming, is devastating on a developing youth. So in the United States, we like to be tough on crime, and we like to vote for politicians who say that they are. In the 1980s, there was an increasing belief that there was increasing levels of crime and violence levels in the United States, and that these were rap rapidly escalating. The popular conception of the modern prisoner was that he was more violent, disturbed, and disruptive than his predecessor. So when you have someone who is more violent, disturbed, and disruptive, you're going to have to come up with new ways to control them. And that's when we start seeing the rise of supermax facilities. They were marketed as the only facilities capable of controlling this new form of, of inmate that we were seeing. So if our, prisons our prisoners have changed, our prisons must change also. In the pre-1980, no supermax prisons existed. Today, over 40 states have at least one, and they house 2% of the prison population. And they're modeled after the permanent lockdown at Marion. And as you can see the quote up there, it's an anonymous quote given by a state official. Politically, a supermax is really easy to sell. There is an appetite for punishment. It taps into public fear without much cost and with big political gain. Notice in that quote that the goal of supermax facilities was political gain, as articulated by this official. So let's examine what, if any, other goals we have with the institution of supermax facilities. To quote a classmate of ours, Morgan Franklin, it's all very unclear. 
Management of violent inmates is the most commonly cited justification for the creation and continued use of supermax facilities, but there still remains a lack of consensus both among critic, critics and among proponents. To give you an idea of how much lack of consensus there are, that phrase, management of violent inmates, was the most commonly cited in a 1997 system-wide survey of correctional facilities that included prison administrators, prison staff, and policymakers, as well as members of the public that were directly related in some way. Management of violent inmates was listed in the top five results by only two-thirds of those surveyed. So in one-third of those surveyed who are directly involved in the process of the creation and implementation of these prisons, the number one goal wasn't even listed in the top five. And also, to further convolute this, there was a disconnect within certain correctional departments between administrators and between administrators and staff, for example, over what went into the top five and what was completely left out. So it's very unclear as to why these prisons, what these prisons are trying to achieve. Supermax prisoners themselves are often described as, quote, the worst of the worst by politicians, correctional officers, and by the public. And when pressed a little bit further as to what the worst of the worst means, one of the most common answers is they're the bad apples of the prison system. Well, that doesn't really give us any description as to who exactly is ending up in supermax facilities and why. States' procedures for identifying and placing prisoners in supermax facilities are rarely published. There's been little research done on the impacts and on the effectiveness of supermax facilities. For example, the Board of Prisons has never conducted a nationwide survey on a federal level of their supermax facilities and their effectiveness. But that kind of makes sense. In order to evaluate achievement, you need to know what you're trying to achieve. And as you can see, there's very little, very little definition on the goals themselves. Now, amongst the public, just looking at public perceptions of supermax facilities, you can see that in 1980, there was a disconnect, almost 50-50, between when asked the question, why do we have supermax facilities, about 50% of the public said, we have them for punishment, and about 50% said, we have them for rehabilitation. So it's unclear there. But then as you see, the rise continues of the, the tough on crime policies through the 1980s and the general fear in the public of, the, of um, crime rates, you start to see a shift. In 1989, punishment is still slightly less than 50%, and rehabilitation is slightly over 50%. But by 1993, when you saw one of the largest waves of supermax facilities being created, 61% of the population said that they were being created for the purpose of punishment. Now that goes really far from our 200 year history when they were originally created to better rehabilitate prisoners. Now you saw from the quote from Charles Dickens earlier that since the inception of this prolonged state of solitary confinement, there have been moral concerns. Well, in recent decades, for the first time, we've had scientific evidence that, that um, really back the moral concerns that were just being observed and based on general ideology and perceptions. Solitary confinement, we now know, causes extensive health issues that start about two, that um, can be irreversible about two weeks in, depending on the pre-existing psyche of the person being placed in solitary confinement. And these health concerns are both mental, emotional, and physical. This has opened up new doors for litigation to be brought under the 8th and 14th Amendments because we now have scientific backing to back claims of cruel and unusual punishment. Interest groups and individuals have been raising moral concerns for, for 200 years, but now instead of just basing on an ideology, we now have scientific evidence that can be backed in the protests. And you're starting to see that dialogue really emerge during the hunger strikes and during protests that occur. Um, and they're gaining more substantial ground in recent years. Additionally, on an international level, we're starting to see some sort of pressure coming into the United States. The United Nations has declared that solitary confinement for more than two weeks is a form of torture, and thus is in violation of internationally agreed upon human rights standards. These concerns are yet to gain much traction, but as you heard in our talk earlier with Ms. Winter, there's been, um, they've become more and more prevalent in the last several years.
All right, so that was our segue into talking about the mind sciences and solitary confinement. So everyone in this class knows what the mind sciences are. We've been talking about it all semester, but why does it matter for solitary confinement? And the reason it matters is because solitary confinement as a practice arose not just due to political and economic constraints, but also largely in part to internal mechanisms acting inside of individual stakeholders in solitary confinement. Some of those are probably pretty obvious when they come to mind, like stereotypes. Others may be less obvious, attribution error, which is the um, tendency to see people's actions as a result of who they are rather than what they're going through. Empathy gaps, studies have showed us that we're People are relatively accurate at assessing the physical pain of others, but pretty inaccurate at assessing the psychological and social pain of others. And that difference is called an empathy gap. Lastly, behavioral confirmation, which is when individuals and groups have stereotypes about each other, and when they subsequently have negative experiences with each other, those stereotypes become confirmed. They feel that they are justified in holding those thoughts by each other. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to run through how those mechanisms act and interact within the public, prisoners, and prison staff. So it's probably not very surprising for me to tell you that the public has pretty strong stereotypes about um, criminals. We've already gone over in this class how in many ways those criminal stereotypes are just the same um, racial stereotypes that have been recasted in stereotypes that are more politically um, and socially acceptable. And why this matters for solitary confinement is that stereotypes tend to exacerbate empathy gaps. And so that means that when we have stereotypes vis-a-vis -vis another individual or group, we become that much worse at estimating their social or psychological pain. And this plays out in the data where we see that people are less likely to support prison reform when they believe that the majority of the prison population is black or African American. And so on one hand, we have stereotypes. Um, another mechanism that does a lot of work is belief in free will. We've talked about how people, at least instinctively, tend to believe that actions are a result of what people desire to happen. And studies have shown that this instinct towards a belief in free will actually increases when it's an act that we perceive to be immoral. And so people are more likely to believe that criminals deserve the result of their actions. And the end result of stereotypes and belief in free will is that it's much easier for the public to justify solitary confinement. Importantly, it eliminates cognitive dissonance, which is the psychological discomfort of holding two beliefs simultaneously. On one hand, knowing that criminals are humans, and on the other, knowing that solitary is probably a pretty bad condition, and that discomfort is reconciled um, via stereotypes and belief in free will. And these are some visual interpretations of stereotypes. All right, so what work do, um, how do the mind sciences explain what happens um, with prisoners and prison staff? So in 1971, Philip Zimbardo and his team of psychologists complete the Stanford Prison Experiment, and Zimbardo is able to show that people tend to assume the role the situation assigns to them. This has been reaffirmed by other studies, and Pierre Bourdieu put it well when he said, institution is thus an act of communication, but of a particular kind. It signifies to someone what his identity is, but in a way that both expresses it to him and imposes it on him, thus informing him in an authoritative manner of what he is and what he must be. So this act of communication that Bordeaux um, mentions begins before either prison staff or prisoners enter solitary confinement. As researcher Craig Haney said, no one enters solitary confinement with a blank psychological state. And so how are both stakeholders coming in. On one, half, on one hand, prison staff have a certain uniform, certain weapons, they have a protocol. Sometimes protocol actually makes physical punishment mandatory, even if the infraction doesn't seem to justify a violent response. And prison staff likely believe that prisoners are going to be dangerous, are mentally ill, and maybe that solitary serves a public good. On the other side, you have prisoners who um, have been told who enter with the idea that solitary holds the worst of the worst. They're expected to be the worst of the worst. The only physical touch they might receive is when being placed in restraints. And if they do have visitation from family or friends, which isn't very often if they do have them, it might be conducted through a video screen Skype session. And so the situation is defining for both groups what their role is. And attribution error defines how they should interact with each other. So if a prisoner acts out, 
a staff member is not likely to see acting out as a result of duress or this person wanted to see their mom in person and not on a video screen. They're more likely to see it as this is a person who acts out. And prisoners, in turn, perceive punishment or discipline not as someone who wants to keep their job, not as someone following protocol, but this is a sadistic person who wants to hurt me. And so that's attribution error. Attribution error can be corrected given um, proper circumstances, but solitary confinement, rather than correcting for attribution error, tends to solidify it through behavioral confirmation. And because prisoners and prison guards largely have disproportionately negative interactions with each other, behavioral confirmation starts to run its course. They believe they're correct in holding their attributes by each other. And as behavioral confirmation runs its course, social norms start to break down. So in normal social interaction, there are reality checks that remind you um, that the person you're interacting with is a human, that remind you that there are social costs of certain actions. Those reality checks do not exist in solitary confinement. And the end result is the kind of abuse that we see. One example, came out in a California case where a prisoner was forced, bathed until his skin fell off. The water was so hot that his skin actually fell off. And the prison staff did not seek medical treatment for him. Dis uh, dis dispositions theory would say, okay, stuff like that happens. You just have really sadistic, evil people on your hands. What situations theory says is these are probably people who have been completely captured by the role they are in. For prisoners, they're in a space about the size of the one I'm standing in, very few possessions, and they begin, may begin to see deviance and violence as the only way to express any kind of individuality. And the end result are psychological effects, um, anxiety, paranoia, depression, cognitive disturbances, confusion, hysteria, um, suicidal tendencies. And what many people don't know is that it's probably obvious to you that prisoners suffer from these things, but many prison staff as well suffer from reduced versions of these mental disturbances. Prisoners in solitary confinement may have adequate food and water. Their cells may meet criteria for humane treatment, but deprived of human contact, utterly cut off from the world, that is enough for many human rights groups to consider it torture. We return now to ABC's Dan Harris, entering his final stretch in solitary. 42 hours in solitary, and my downstairs neighbor is acting up again. When guards come to get him for a court appearance, he refuses to leave. The inmate appears to be yelling for a shotgun. Mr. Harris, pack all your stuff up, get everything together, make sure you bring all your trash out, you're being released. Finally, after nearly 48 hours, it's the moment I've been waiting for. I am glad that is over. Before I leave here for good, the guards let me interview some of my fellow inmates about this experience we've now shared. Not a man in this place is not the same as when they came in here. It changes you? Oh yeah, most definitely. There are some people who think solitary confinement is, is torture. Yeah. Straight up it legalized is. torture. It is. So it's the even, hardest thing I ever did. It, this is the hardest thing you've ever oh, done? By far. I don't know how much sympathy there is in the general public mm -hmm. for people who have no, committed there's, crimes. there's none. You can make a case that it, it's good for some people who keep getting in trouble, like you, to be hit in the face with reality. Like, if you're violent, I think you should be in here. But other than that, I don't think you should be in solitary. It is perhaps not surprising that the criminals who are actually locked up in solitary would argue that it's torture. We're going to turn right here. But as I'm guided out of the jail... People are usually in a good mood at this point in the process. You know, majority of the people are in an ecstatic mood. Given my stuff back... But I think the main thing you'd be looking for would be your cell phone. I missed my cell phone. Okay. And allowed to change into my own clothes... So let's just put the clothes in that hole right there. Mixed in with the giddiness of liberty. We'll head out this way here. Our real right. questions about the cost of solitary confinement in this country, financial, psychological, and societal. Freedom will start once we pass this second door. After all, all of this is being done in our Outside name and on our Outside dime. For Nightline, this is Dan Harris in Denver. Okay, so 
the media is helping and also not helping, as I think that this really makes abundantly clear. Um, so solitary confinement in supermax prisons is widespread. We've already addressed that. Um, but the thing is about media representations is that they're often inadequate and misleading. Um, and as Margaret Winter you know, told us, media is information. And for a lot of people, the media is their only source of information. And currently, what people are getting is largely misinformation. And even if the media has good intentions, which we didn't really get into that, but I like to think that they do, um, they're really not they're really not helping us in the way that we need them to help us in terms of giving us the information we need as the public. And the issue with that is that they're thus unlikely to impact the audiences in any meaningful way and motivate us as the public to want to affect change. Um, and why that's important is whether you're looking at advocacy movements, legislation, litigation, having the population care about what you're trying to change is important to the, ex the success of your movement. Um, and so what the media analysts for this group did is we looked at fictional represent, sorry, <laughs> fictional representations, non-print journalism, and then print journalism. And the questions that we kept in mind as we were looking, and we want you to keep in mind as I kind of talk you through what we found, is kind of how accurate are these representations? What are the consequences of us not getting accurate information? And what are we learning from the information that we're given? So I first am gonna talk about fictional representations. And so the biggest fictional representation uh, that touches on solitary confinement right now is Orange is the New Black. And it has been kind of widely praised by the media for being a pretty accurate portrayal of um, prison inmates and life in prison. And the issue, to, the issue of solitary confinement comes up a number of times in the series. Um, most notably, the main character, Piper, who I think the audience would tends to see as a rational, mentally healthy character is put in solitary for, we're not really sure how long, it seems to be a period of weeks, maybe months, we're not entirely sure. Um, and then, so we see her emerge in the beginning of the second season and we're gonna play that clip for you just to kind of show you the difference. Chapman, let's go, up, up, up. On your feet. I thought that Foley was on duty today. Is it breakfast already? No, but if you're hungry, you can lick yesterday's off the wall. Nasty. No, this, this, this is art. This is a yellow warbler drinking out of a daffodil. She just cannot get enough. I'm calling it Thirsty Bird. So we see a quite changed Piper, which leads us to think, okay, solitary confinement has serious effects on people's mental health. But then the big issue is kind of within this episode, it's a 40 minute, 40 minute episode and with, by the end of it, she's fine. There's absolutely no sign that she's been through any kind of emotional or mental trauma. And I think that what that teaches us is to think, especially for people who don't have prior existing mental health issues is that you know, solitary confinement doesn't really have an effect. Once you're out, you're fine. And I think that for a lot of people, like if that's the only kind of information you're getting about solitary confinement, that's hugely problematic. But that's not the only information. Now I'm going to talk about um, television and non-print journalism, kind of like that clip that we saw. Um, so televised coverage is pretty rare in part due to the fact that there's a lot of there are a lot of access restrictions, but when these TV reports do surface, they tend to focus on extreme, really attention-grabbing imagery. For example, recent reports have shown inmates screaming violently, ripping apart the Bible, and in one case, uh, we, as Christian talked about, the man who received the third-degree burns from the bathing practices. And um, you know, these news coverages, this news coverage purports to expose the ugly side of solitary confinement. But the issue is that this really sensationalized reporting actually inadvertently overshadows the inmates' perspectives and it actually kind of obscures the psychological trauma that they're going through. Um, and so 
the issue is, is that these newscasts offer a really dehumanizing view of the inmates. They might induce like a sense of pity or awe in us, but you know, they're really not showing us how these are fundamentally human experiences and that these are humans like we are and that they're going through real trauma. Um, and then turning to undercover reporting, this is further uh, causing the issue of us seeing prisoners as dehumanized. Um, so, you know, we see reporting like, like that we saw in the clip where, you know, you have a reporter go into solitary completely voluntarily for, you know, 48 hours or however many hours to get an insider's perspective. And the issue is, is this isn't an insider's perspective. He knows he's leaving. Um, he's not there for very long. And so we're not really getting to understand what it's like for the actual prisoners who are in this situation. So turning to print journalism, we see a lot of the same issues. The big reason that we're seeing this, well, one of the big reasons is that there are a lot of state law and prison policies that limit media access to the prison system. Um, for example, in California, the policies prohibit inmates from participating in scheduled face-to-face -face interviews, and so people who go in from, um, the media who go in actually get randomized prisoners to talk to, and so they might not even get someone who's been in solitary, they might not get someone who really is capable of providing them with information. Um, and so, you know, what we're seeing is that we don't get to learn much about the actual sensory deprivation that they're going through, how arbitrary um, the power to put someone in solitary can be. Um, and again, this just keeps us from realizing the humanity of the prisoners here um, and also contributes to us just, it reinforces that these people are criminals and not humans. Um, and, you know, when prisons control the information, what's there to do, sort of? Um, and so I just think that it's important to understand that while the media may be trying to help, they're kind of giving us a really skewed perspective and that, one, we should care about fixing that, and two, just kind of keeping that in mind as we go forward talking to you about the issue. All right. Um. Hi, so uh, I'm here to present the work of The Economist, that is those of us who are looking at the question from a law and economics perspective. And so there's a number of different ways to do that. Um, one way is to do a cost-benefit analysis. Um, I'm sure you've all heard the term. Uh, you basically consider the costs on one hand and the benefits on the other. Uh, so far, listening to me, you've only suffered costs, for example, and no benefits. Um, but looking at a larger policy question, right, like uh, how you organize a correctional system, um, you uh, can also consider large uh, costs and, and, and benefits. So um, we have to remember that here we're not considering the costs and benefits of uh, whether to send somebody to prison um, or having that person out in um, society, but rather once you've determined, once the legal system has determined that the person is going to be in prison, um, what kind of a prison uh, do we send the person to? And so um, costs uh, to various options of correctional system uh, can really differ. Um, you can have uh, a regular maximum security prison uh, on one hand, and you can have a supermax prison, uh, which uh, by all accounts costs much more to sustain uh, because of larger uh, operational costs, construction, and also staffing. Um, and then, as we've seen through the presentation, you also have costs that result from the mental, physical, and health impacts of uh, solitary confinement in supermax prisons. On the benefit side, um, there are arguments um, for supermax use, and um, part of what goes into a cost-benefit analysis is considering whether the data bear out the arguments that are explained on the benefit side. And so some of those arguments include, well, reduced violence. You know, maybe in general prison populations, um, you have, um, you have uh, reduced violence if you've removed certain elements to supermax prisons. Uh, maybe you have uh, reduced recidivism after people have left supermax because of the shock of the experience as a deterrent effect. Um, but uh, first thing to say is that there actually isn't a lot of uh, uh, good data on this, and uh, um, unfortunately, that's a, that's a huge problem and something that needs to be remedied. But based on the information that we have, some studies that have looked at these issues, um, there are some serious doubts about uh, the empirical support for some of these uh, benefits. And so, for example, studies have shown that um, there is uh, little evidence of reduced inmate on inmate or rather no evidence of reduced inmate on inmate violence uh, after the inclusion of supermax prisons in some areas, uh, and very uh, mixed evidence of 
reduce inmate on staff violence after the introduction to a prison system of supermax prisons. Um, similarly, on the recidivism side, uh, actually evidence seems to suggest the opposite, that people recidivate more after they've exited a supermax prison and actually recidivate sooner. Um, and again, one important thing to remember is that there is l a little information about this, so um, that, that continued research really needs to occur. But if we've already seen on one hand that there's a huge amount of costs, right, and then the benefits are called into question, then it really sort of um, poses, a, uh, poses a question for people to consider. Um, and another economic tool that we can use um, is game theoretic analysis that allows us to abstract away from uh, the concrete data if that data um, uh, isn't available. And uh, we've done that. Um, so um, I want to draw uh, your attention, if you can think back a few weeks, to uh, the work that we were doing with uh, Plufi Putnam. Uh, and we were considering two different kinds of uh, boats uh, and the extent to which they could be, uh, they could be harmed um, by either docking or not docking. So uh, we've actually analogized from that situation um, and considered two different kinds of prisons, uh, two different kinds of prisons and two different kinds of prisoners. Um, two different kinds of prisoners uh, would be, uh, on one hand, um, you can, oh, I guess we've already seen the slide here, uh, solitary neutral prisoners, um, which would be, say, prisoners less likely to suffer a lot of damage um, if they are in solitary confinement, and on the other hand, solitary vulnerable prisoners, which uh, are li likely to suffer a lot of damage. Uh, and then uh, when we consider two different kinds of prisons, we have uh, the analogy to someone uh, docking the boat uh, or not docking the boat, that is putting somebody in an environment where they're likely to suffer costs or putting somebody in an environment where they're not likely to suffer costs. And so you can actually go through the, um, go through the decision nodes here. Uh, and what's important here to consider is uh, as the general principle, a situation as it, is, as it exists now, is the prison really has a dominant strategy in uh, putting people into solitary confinement in supermax prisons if the payoffs uh, are uh, always more positive in supermax. Um, and um, maybe uh, next slide. Um, you can see that if you change, uh, and I think we've got a pointer here, which actually will help uh, bear this out, but um, if you change uh, one of the costs um, to a negative cost, that is, so if you're imposing a new kind of liability rule for the prison, um, such that the prison has to compensate the prisoner for any suffered damages, uh, then really the cost-benefit decision the particular one that the prison makes and the prison system makes is, is actually very different. Uh, and so in this context, for the prison, it becomes really important to know whether the prisoner that he's uh, considering is solitary neutral or solitary vulnerable. Because again, uh, if the prisoner is solitary neutral, then uh, it'll uh, choose one set of outcomes um, that would be more uh, beneficial. And if it's solitary uh, vulnerable, then another decision um, is more convenient. So here you see the prison, which is an alternative approach where it only suffer, gets, uh, gets five as opposed to negative 20 because it suffers now the increased cost of putting that solitary vulnerable person into solitary confinement. Um, and so we can um, use this information um, and try to find a solution that will help overcome that information uh, shortfall. And one way to do that would be to have uh, better mental health screening for prisoners. And naturally, these have a cost of their own, which you can then include also in the uh, uh, payoffs uh, and your consideration of the various payoffs. But um, the bottom line is that if the prison knows whether it's considering a, a solitary neutral prisoner or a solitary vulnerable prisoner, then it's more likely to be able to assess uh, whether that person should be in solitary confinement or not. Um, and uh, that results in lower costs, not only for the prison, but also, you know, very importantly for the prisoner, leading to an efficient outcome. Thank you very much. Because we have uh, Bryce uh, telling us about tort. All right. A man who spent 22 months in solitary confinement is getting a huge payout from Donna Anna County, New Mexico. Stephen Slevin was reportedly severely neglected while in jail, forcing him to rip out his own tooth because he was not permitted to see a dentist. The 59-year-old former inmate said his toenails grew so long that they curled around his feet and fungus grew on his skin because he was denied the privilege of taking a shower. He was incarcerated from 2005 to 2007 for a charge of driving under the influence. Slevin was initially placed in a padded cell for several days, but he was transferred to solitary confinement without any explanation from jail authorities or even a trial. A photo taken at his booking showed him clean-shaven and healthy-looking. 
Two years later, his face was sunken in, accentuated by long, scraggly hair, while severely depressed eyes stared back at the camera. That picture helped his case. The lawsuit has been settled, awarding Slevin $15.5 million. All right, as Pedro said, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the current state of tort doctrine and how it relates to solitary confinement. Uh, since this is a frontier torts project, uh, we tried to focus on what are the outer bounds right now of the tort doctrine and how it's uh, used in relation to solitary confinement, and maybe ideas for expanding that or strategies that attorneys could use to, uh, to expand the frontier. So uh, first, I'm going to talk about cruel and unusual punishment uh, under the Eighth Amendment. As it stands right now, uh, courts have pretty universally uh, decided that solitary confinement alone is not cruel and unusual. Uh, so in some cases, uh, other factors in addition to solitary confinement can combine together and uh, constitute cruel and unusual punishment, but by itself, solitary confinement is not cruel and unusual according to the courts. However, uh, the Supreme Court has also ruled that cruel and unusual punishment uh, is defined by changing societal norms. So uh, something for practitioners to kind of focus on is have societal norms changed to such a point that we would now consider solitary confinement cruel and unusual? And along with that, uh, courts have also decided that prisoners with pre-existing mental health issues deserve more protection under the law than prisoners that go into solitary confinement that don't have pre-existing mental health issues. So uh, in looking at, um, at plaintiffs, practitioners should try to focus on plaintiffs who have pre-existing mental health issues since courts have been more friendly to them in litigation. So the next kind of category we're looking at is due process violations under the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. So solitary confinement uh, a lot of times is used as a disciplinary measure uh, for prisoners who uh, misbehave while they're actually in prison. So courts have ruled that due process protections apply uh, to prisoners being placed in solitary confinement. So they should have the right to uh, confront witnesses, uh, present evidence on their own behalf, and things like that. Unfortunately, uh, these suits a lot of times will not entirely eliminate solitary confinement, obviously, because once these due, process, uh, due processes are in place, um, the prisoner can be placed in solitary confinement once they've gone through this process. So our last one uh, I wanted to talk about, this one is definitely on the frontier, so we were creative, and uh, <laughs> said, okay, what kind of tort can we bring uh, to help prisoners in solitary confinement? So we came up with intentional infliction of emotional distress. Uh, we've talked a lot about the severe psychological impacts on um, prisoners in solitary confinement. So. How would this work exactly? So uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress is typically a common law tort claim. So it's gonna, the, the elements of the claim are going to change from state to state. But typically, these are, the, these are the elements. So recklessly or intentionally causing severe emotional distress by extreme and outrageous conduct. So kind of going through it a little bit, reckless or intentional, uh, we could argue that from the increasing evidence and uh, you know media reports and scientific studies that are being done about how uh, the rate of suicide and mental illness increase dramatically when people are placed in solitary confinement, uh, prisons should be aware of this information that's out there. So maybe we can say that they are recklessly causing these, uh, recklessly putting people in solitary confinement. So then, causing severe emotional distress. Obviously, the plaintiff has to show that they're in severe emotional distress. I think from some of the videos we've played, we've already found some, some people that have severe emotional distress from being placed in solitary confinement. And then by extreme and outrageous conduct, this might be a little bit trickier because solitary confinement is very commonplace. So is it extreme and outrageous? And um, one of the standards we looked at, um, the court said that extreme and outrageous conduct means conduct that is outside the bounds of all human decency. So in my opinion, solitary confinement, outside the bounds of all human decency, it's probably at least getting close to that. And through some good lawyering, I think we can probably make that argument. So just to recap here at the end, some recommendations uh, we would make for people who are bringing tort actions. So seek out plaintiffs with pre-existing mental health issues because courts have been more friendly to these plaintiffs. 
highlight research regarding severe psychological effects because um, as the courts learn more and more about how bad these things are, maybe those definitions of cruel and unusual will change or extreme and outrageous. Also, focus on the change in societal norms. So is society as a whole really willing to accept solitary confinement as an acceptable form of punishment? Um, so now I think we're moving on to policy. It's hard to tell in the candlelight, but the backdrop of this vigil is a prison in Norwalk, California. That's where inmates, among many dozens in prisons across the state, are on a nearly two-month-long hunger strike to protest their solitary confinement. Now, their families are speaking up. Right now, under federal government law, research chimpanzees are protected from being held in solitary confinement because they're defined as social beings and that it's detrimental to their mental and physical health. So how much more of a social being is my son or is you know my friend's husband or somebody else's son? I mean, a human being is the most social being that there is. I'm not going to... Let my son die. The inmates want prisons to stop housing them in near isolation for years on end, simply because they're associated with gangs. There's no reason why they should be held in a cage 23 hours out of the day. I haven't held my son in 10 years. I haven't been able to touch him. And this has to stop. I won't lose my son. I will not lose my son. State officials argue solitary confinement helps keep prison gangs in check. But on Friday, a United Nations expert said the practice in the U.S. can amount to torture. So uh, before transitioning to talk about our proposed policy solutions, I'm going to frame the discussion by providing a brief overview of the various stakeholders that are present in this debate. So I'll begin with those that are most impacted by the use of solitary confinement, that is, um, the group's calling for an end to this practice. And then I'll conclude uh, with an overview of those who have a vested interest in maintaining the use of solitary confinement and the existence of supermax prisons. Um, so we'll start with prisoners and their families. Um, compared to other stakeholders, I think it's obvious that um, prisoners and their families have the greatest stake in this issue. Unfortunately, their voices are often the softest in this debate. Um, the ability of prisoners to advocate on their behalf and participate in the political process is obviously inhibited by virtue of their confinement. Um, and as we saw in the video, uh, the families are often caught up, cut off from their family members for decades at a time. Moreover, uh, low-income, immigrant, racially marginalized communities are overrepresented in prisons. And therefore, to the extent that their families are interested in engaging with the political process to bring an end to solitary confinement, they may face significant barriers in terms of bringing about meaningful change for obvious reasons. Uh, but against all odds, remarkably, prisoners have found a way to advocate for themselves. Um, a couple recent examples are the hunger strikes that took place in the Pelican Bay Prison in California and uh, the Maynard Correctional Facility in Illinois. So we'll move along to prisoners' rights advocates. It's important to highlight the fact that the movement to end solitary um, has had been advanced significantly by the effort of advocacy organizations and civil society coalitions. Um, the American Civil Liberties Union and the Human Rights Watch are some of the larger players, but there's also a number of smaller local religious nonprofit organizations that are devoted to this cause and shed important light on the issue. As you would imagine, um, these nonprofit organ organizations face an uphill battle in trying to bring, bring about change. Um, compared to corporate business interests, uh, these groups have relatively little funding to work with in terms of their lobbying efforts and mounting a campaign. Uh, and generally speaking, um, supermax prison inmates are not the most sympathetic poster children um, or plaintiffs. Um, nevertheless, advocates have been successful in a number of cases, um, we had the talk with uh, Ed Arrow, um, and then they've also had some remarkable um, results in closing some more controversial facilities across the country. So next we'll transition to um, an overview of politicians, communities, and private industry. Um, so as we discussed previously, politicians have a lot to gain from fostering a reputation for being tough on crime. And as you would imagine, little to gain for advocating, from advocating for prisoners' rights. It's all, we also want to highlight that they face a significant amount of pressure from the communities surrounding these facilities. Um, 
who are either seeking to establish a supermax facility in their neighborhood or want to keep one open, open and operational. Um, super, prisons in general, but supermax facilities in particular, can represent a huge source of jobs for an economically depressed community. Um, in a general, this you may know this, but in a general population prison, many of the available jobs are performed by the prisoners. But obviously, in a supermax facility, prisoners are prevented from working, and they also require a two to three guard escort anytime they leave their cell. So that that comes out to equal a lot of job opportunity for the surrounding community. Um, additionally, supermax facilities are usually built brand new from the ground up, so they come with considerable construction contracts and a lot of temporary construction work. And then once they're built, um, they represent a huge sunk cost, um, and the facilities often can't be retrofitted for use with a general prison population. So there's just a lot of general pressure to keep these facilities operational simply because of the initial investment that was required. Um, and then lastly, just to touch on the role of private companies in this issue, um, obviously private companies not only run, but also provide goods and services for supermax facilities. Um, so they have a, a obvious vested interest in the continued operation of these facilities. But speaking about solitary confinement in general, the fact that solitary confinement increases recidivism um, means that the practice of solitary confinement ensures a future revenue stream in a kind of sick and twisted way for these companies because repeat offenders mean that they will be able to count on that future revenue. So there's a lot of perverse incentives when you start to talk about uh, the role of private industry. So next, um, we just want to point out that another really powerful voice in this discussion is the prison employee unions. Obviously, their primary focus is on protecting jobs. Um, and as mentioned before, supermax facilities can represent a huge number of jobs for correctional officers. But even when a prison, a proposed prison closure will result in no job loss, um, unions have come out with strong positions against closing supermax facilities. And in fact, when there was a recent effort to close the TAMS prison in Southern Illinois, the local correctional officer union said that closure of the facility would, quote, destabilize the entire prison system, worsen dangerous overcrowding, and put the safety of employees, inmates, youth, and the public at risk. Um, so despite the focus on, and, and that's because they've bought into this narrative that um, solitary confinement, many times they've bought into this narrative that solitary confinement promotes safety within a prison. Um, and that their lives are at risk, and so that solitary confinement promotes on-the-job safety for them. But as the evidence mounts um, demonstrating that solitary actually increases the rate of violence in prisons, uh, many, not many, but several unions have uh, come out and sort of reevaluated their position on this and actually um, joined the fight to end solitary, or at least reduce the reliance on it. So lastly, we'll just talk about the government and the Federal Bureau of Prisons. The government maintains that there is no systematic use of solitary confinement in this country. And in fact, they've been testifying to that end in front of the UN Committee on, Against Torture um, the past two days. Um, and so that idea is predicated on the fact that this is segregated housing, a special housing unit. This isn't solitary. They contend that prisoners are not uh, deprived truly of human interaction because they can interact with one another through cell doors. And also because uh, they can interact with one another in these recreation cages that they get a few hours in a week. Also, um, they receive human interaction through their visits with correctional uh, staff and medical staff of the prison. Um, but as you would imagine, that interaction is not always positive. Um, so, Though the federal government, the, the BOP um, and the government uses this point to argue that um, there's no, technically no use of solitary confinement, they're really unable to provide any data um, in terms of the number of times these visits occur, or generally speaking, um, there's really no data out there about the use of solitary confinement in the federal or state prison systems. Um, we also um, want to, highlight that most supermax facilities are actually run at the state level by state departments of corrections where there's even less accountability and even less reporting. Um, but there are a few bright spots, um, thankfully, 
uh, it's getting harder for the BOP to maintain this position. Um, and there's been f uh, five states over the past decade that have enacted some pretty sweeping reforms to reduce reliance on solitary confinement with some remarkable results. And so in a, we just want to close with this quote um, from a recent government accountability report that was prepared for Congress on the BOP's use of solitary confinement. Um, and um, in their recommendations, they said that as the BOP considers options for conducting their first study of segregated housing, they may want to consider lessons learned from state initiatives that reduced the number of inmates held in segregation without significant adverse impacts on violence or assault rates. So with that in mind, I'm gonna turn it over to Judy, our resident policy wonk. We need to ensure that incarceration is used to punish, to deter, and to rehabilitate, but not merely to warehouse and to forget. After years of neglect, the voices of parents, prisoners, psychologists, and civil libertarian groups are starting to be heard by those in political power. Attorney General Eric Holder amended the Prison Rape Elimination Act to ensure that prison employees are screened for prior sexual abuse. And a United States Senate hearing on solitary confinement, the first of its kind, was chaired by Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois. This is the first ever congressional hearing on solitary confinement. The United States holds far more prisoners in segregation or solitary confinement than any other democratic nation on earth. Durbin heard from experts, questioned the director of federal prisons, and even brought in a replica of an isolation cell onto the Senate floor. We're seeing an alarming increase in isolation for those who don't really need to be there, and for many, many vulnerable groups like immigrants, children, LGBT inmates, supposedly there for their own protection. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking about the policy uh, goals, first of all, um, to solving the solitary confinement issue in this country. And then um, I'm going to look at different ways that various actors in this country have um, attempted to uh, quell some of the effects and how we can move forward from there. Uh, so first, these were the sort of the two goals that we came to the conclusion were most uh, sort of broad and sweeping in, in our policy reform, which was to first discourage the use of solitary confinement for minor infractions and more frequently evaluate psychological state of inmates and provide adequate mental health care. So those two, um, I think, are a pretty good place to start. Um, and what has been interesting about doing solitary confinement is that there's actually a lot of stuff that's been done um, so far in, in different states and from um, various outside actors um, to stop the problem. So uh, as Ms. Winter stated before, Mississippi and Alabama are uh, really interesting states to look at for their reform. Uh, we chose to look at Maine, um, which ha had very sweeping reforms uh, enacted in 2010. Um, so Maine's governor in 2010 decided that this would be an issue that he was going to take on. Um, and he, within a matter of months, him and the commissioner made some sweeping changes. He ordered that inmates not be placed in isolation for longer than 72 hours. Uh, he imposed a seven-day limit. Um, and he reclassified and moved out of supermax many prisoners who simply uh, appeared to be there unnecessarily. He also um, stopped cell extractions, which is basically the process of for people who are acting out, which often meant uh, the mentally ill uh, and would be moved to solitary. He stopped that process as well. Um, so in two years, he halved the solitary confinement uh, population in all of Maine's prisons. And I think this is a really good place to start because this state action um, was successful because it required the participation of outside actors and the government um, and the prison system. And that's kind of how we look at all reform going forward as a, sort of a three-part, if not more, um, process. So the ACLU was particularly helpful in Maine. They kind of saw an opening um, and really... Uh, you know, employed or deployed, I guess, their resources and uh, encouraged lots of advocacy and activism and, and worked hard to meet with the prison system and the people involved in the prisons themselves to try and create a, a system that they would be okay implementing, um, which sometimes gets forgotten when you think about reforming the prison system is that there's a lot of people involved who have to participate and who have to make the changes. Um, so these groups advised the state um, and advised the prison system, and together they kind of came up with these reforms. Um, 
So this has been working really well in Maine, but um, Maine's prison population is not necessarily indicative of the countries. And while this has worked really well in this state, it's not necessarily, it's certainly not binding on any other states. And so it's important to look at how it could affect the entire country. So um, what could be most directly helpful is federal legislation. Um, there's been no federal reform on solitary confinement. Um, and as Michaela notes, they often deny that it even is happening or they refer to it as segregation. Um, so, but this summer in May, um, a congressman from Louisiana, Cedric Richmond, he introduced the Solitary Confinement Study and Reform Act, which um, would introduce a more humane system that accelerates reform. It would establish a commission to study the use of solitary confinement, and it would require the Department of Justice to issue regulations that would be standardized for throughout the country. Um, this would significantly alter the system, particularly for the mentally ill patients and juveniles who are um, in, in solitary confinement across the country. Uh, the effects of this would be twofold. First of all, as Michaela noted, uh, there's very little nationwide research. So having a commission um, by the Attorney General to study the effects and to figure out who is in these cells and what the population looks like would be extremely important. Um, and also, it would standardize how solitary confinement is treated throughout the country. Um, it also, if, if um, states did not uphold their uh, side of the bargain, they would, they would have a room, the, they would take away some of their prison budget, um, which would incentivize states to follow these procedures and regulations. Um, as of July, this is in committee, so it's in the Crime, Terrorism, Homeland Security Investigation Subcommittee, which um, is great. However, it is important to note that this bill only has democratic support, and we live in a very polarized political climate, so you know the likelihood of it getting out of committee, let alone into the House, let alone into the Senate, is very unlikely. Um, but it's important that these type of acts and um, these type of, you know, this movement is keeps the conversation going and it also uh, sort of puts an effort on the government to rethink their strategies and to figure out new ways to look at it. Uh, and as also as Michaela mentioned, another way we could alter federal practices is through the Bureau of Prisons directly. Um, if they commissioned um, some sort of change and it actually they've become stricter about their use of solitary confinement, they actually in 2011 started implementing more uh, units and more sentences that required solitary confinement and using it more as a disciplinary practice. But because these practices have been, you know, a little controversial, they're actually undergoing an internal audit at the moment um, in which I think they're going to be looking at 13 prisons across the country. Um, and, you know, the study could be, it, the study isn't out yet and I sort of look forward to seeing what it says. And it could be very telling about what's happening. Um, although you never know with internal audits. Um, but uh, it, it should be, it, it's at least a first step to kind of figuring out what is going on in these prisons. Um, and also what has been useful in both of these efforts, or in all three of these efforts, is the, um, the NGOs involved in the processes. Um, the government and the Bureau of Prisons are not really equipped, I don't think, to do the amount of research, the interviews, the kind of groundwork that is necessary to um, encourage change. And the Bureau of Prisons met with a bunch of different organizations in DC before doing this audit. The, they're constantly on the Hill with lobbyists, et cetera, meeting with different politicians. Um, so it's good to see that there's some sort of um, advocates uh, in the prisoner's favor in Washington. Um, I also think it's important to note that we can, looking forward, take some advice from the international community. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, uh, solitary confinement is considered torture by the UN, and we could be sanctioned for our use of torture if we ever sat in front of the UN and admitted our practices, basically. Um, so that is, you know, is, I don't think it's as well known as it should be. Um, and. There are also some various countries who have banned it, and we could look to their practices. I know particularly the Netherlands and Germany uh, have recently banned solitary confinement, and 
you know, we do have the largest solitary confinement of the democratic world, or population of the democratic world. So even talking to other, you know, prime ministers, presidents, whatever, to see how they handle this type of population could be really useful looking forward. Um, so while I think that the sort of crux of the issue is to garner support from organizations, from outside actors, from various governmental um, institutions, I, I think what I found most interesting, at least, about this project is sort of thinking outside the box and going for the creative solution. Uh, so we had talked a lot in our group about ways that other you know, participants in the process could get involved and could become more of a voice. Um, Michaela mentioned all of the various other actors. And we were thinking of the people who build these prisons and the people who staff them and who offer food for the prisoners, and if they kind of had some sort of active civil disobedience and were like, didn't want to participate in anymore, what that would say. Um, I know that there's, it's, there's been some sort of, not with solitary confinement, but there have been other, for instance, like in the, the death penalty, there are drug companies who refuse to provide the drugs to participate in that. And what if, you know, unions of food service providers said they wouldn't provide food for prisoners who are stuck in solitary confinement and if there are ways to create action from the inside. Um, and as we look forward to our policy solutions um, and go through them, I would just have you all think about if you have any other creative solutions or any other um, policy options that are sort of outside the box and not within the you know, realm of the federal government, state government, NGO system <laughs> that we've all become accustomed to. Um, so I will, uh, yeah, so we'll discuss that now. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. We have a very limited amount of time to do this, so we're going to do it as efficiently as possible. But we're going to go through each solution, and um, we're going to let you ask your questions in that venue because our white paper is available to you, um, and we'll do our best with what we've been given. So Vika and Judy, can you guys come up here? They're going to help me out. Um, so our first one is to abolish solitary confinement of minors. Um, if anybody has pros or cons or questions, please raise your hand. <laughs> 